should be played at high volume. This should be played at high volume. This should be played at high volume. Preferably in a residential area. The following thoughts on Hoppy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Voted as best local podcast in Tampa Bay by the Creative Loafing. You're listening to Hoppy Hour. What up? What is happening? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And live on the show is a legend in this business. From the Phillips File on Real Radio 104.1 in Orlando, Jim Phillips is on the line. How's it going, Jim? Very good. How you doing? How you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. I've been a big fan of your work for years now. I had XM Radio when I lived in the Midwest, and I would listen to you guys when you were on there, so I'm very pumped to get you on. Yeah, that's when we were worldwide. We're not quite worldwide anymore, but it's okay. How hard was it when you guys lost XM Radio? Did you just see it as you're going to keep on grinding and doing your top-rated show, or did it hurt a bit? Eh, I don't think it hurt. I mean, it's always nice to know that somebody in the North Pole can pick us up or in Japan, but, you know, we're a, we're still a local, you know, a local program. We're still Central Florida. That's what we've, all, what we've always been. Like to be in other parts of the state in the Southeast, but it is what it is. How loyal has Orlando and the listeners been to you over all these years as you've been a big name in that area? Well, I mean, if the ratings are any indication, they've been very loyal. I mean, I'm always asking when I'm behind the, you know, asking myself when I'm behind the microphone whether anybody's listening. You know, I don't know. I mean, you just do what you do. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we hear from people halfway around the world and we go, oh, my goodness gracious. You know, and then sometimes you're in Orlando and you introduce yourself to somebody. And they said, well, what kind of music do you play? So, you know, it depends. It just depends. But, you know, by and large over the years, it's been doing it 27 years now, the program. And people have been very good, very good to the to me and the program. Isn't it weird that us talking into the microphone or you doing your show, like, this will make people's day? Like, it just feels like us talking or when you're doing your show, it just feels like you talking to your friends in the room. But isn't it weird that people actually listen to us? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, that's the nature of the program. That's how radio's changed over the years. You know, when I was a years and years and years ago when I was a teenager listening to the radio. You know, you'd have disc jockeys who sounded like a disc jockey. I mean, they were, and now people are more, they're more human when they're on the radio. And I think, of course, Howard Stern changed that. He was the first to really bring it to the forefront. And that's what's been good about radio, because now you don't necessarily have to have somebody with a deep voice who talks way down here. You know, to do a good job on the radio, as long as you, you know, as long as you don't have a speech impediment, but that might even work for you nowadays as well. As long as you're interesting. Radio is a stream of consciousness. That's all that it is, at least the way that I look at it. Whatever is on my mind, I throw it out there. And as uh, as many people have said, consultants, especially in radio now, it's a kitchen table. You just sit down and you talk to the people who are in the studio with you like you're like their neighbors or members of the family, and you treat the audience the same way for the most part. Now, whenever you speak your mind, do you ever get nervous that people might take it out of context since, like, in 2016 we're offended by everything? Or do you just keep on, like, doing your thing and you just don't care? Well, that's their problem. You know? Yeah. I mean, if they if they don't understand it or if they don't like it, I got over that a long time ago. I mean, that's on their shoulders, you know, I say what I believe. Every once in a while, do I pull their leg a little bit or exaggerate? Well, of course, I still have, I still have to entertain people. But for the most part, you know, I say what I believe. Sometimes people get it. Sometimes people don't. But if they don't get it or they get angry or upset, that's their problem. That's not my problem. That's on their shoulders. Now, over the years, have you been able to see that some people get more easily offended, or is this just a trend that will go away? So how has it been for you over your radio career? People are used to it now. You know, when I first started in the in the talk business, and I've been in radio forever. I've been in radio since 1968, and then I've been doing a talk show for 27 years. And when I first started out, and most talk when I first started out was political. That's yeah. all people talked about. It was either local politics or national politics or some big national political issue. And even though I like politics, that's not what got the phones 
ringing. That's not what got the calls coming in. It was so many different things. I'll give you an example, and I've told the story a million times, and you know Drew, and Drew's heard the story a million times. One of the first things I ever did, I was laying on my waterbed, if you can remember waterbeds back yeah. in the day, 27 years ago. I'm laying back, and I'm watching the uh, ceiling fan go around and around. And if you watch anything go around and around long enough, you stare at it long enough, it starts going in the other direction. It's like, uh, so when I went on the air that day, I said, and I've been thinking about this because I was on the waterbed watching the uh, ceiling fan go around. And, you know, if you ever watch an old Western movie, an old one, old John Wayne movie, and the stagecoach goes by, and the stagecoach is going right to left, but it appears that the wheels are going backwards. Yeah. Why is that? In the space of 30 seconds, the, the the lines blink, 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 blink. People are calling in because people understand that, and they're people who know how to answer the question instead of some ephemeral political crap that most people aren't too interested in. No, that's a very good observation that you just see just by, like, relaxing during the day. Would you say you're a very observational person where you try to find things to talk about? Because for me, I'm trying to become that so I can bring things to the air. You know what I mean? Well, that's the way that I approach it. I can't speak for anybody else in the business, but my program is basically observational. Hey, I saw this. Hey, I witnessed this. Hey, I saw this on TV. Hey, this happened to me. Let me uh, let me explain what happened. What do you think about that? You know, you're just uh, essentially telling a story to try to connect to the audience somehow. Now, would you say that you've been like that since day one, or have you grown where you became more observational over the past 27 years of being in talk radio? became more observational. Yeah. You know, when you first start out in the business, you're trying to emulate usually someone who is, uh, you know, a mentor or someone you've heard. And, uh, you know, we all rip off one another. I don't know where it started, but Neil Rogers, the late Neil Rogers out of Miami, was the talk show host who I wanted to be. You know, so I'd, I'd, I'd rip him off, you know, as best I could. Because you're trying to you're trying to garner some of the success that you see from somebody else, then you just kind of you know move into your own into into your own character, I suppose. But we still rip off people. At least I do. I yeah. hear something that I think is funny, or you know, I'll, I'll use it. I just try to give a little bit more attribution now instead of just blatantly ripping somebody off and and trying to have everybody believe it uh, that, that that I originated it. What do you think of these guys who are just from the 90s and they never grew where they just blatantly ripped off guys like Howard and Opie and Anthony and they're doing their thing now and they're doing the same crap they did back then? Because what I see from your show is you've grown over the years and just you get better and better. But a lot of these guys, you know what I mean? They're just in the 90s and they don't know how to leave that shock jock genre. Well, I don't know if I'm getting better and better. I appreciate the compliment, but <clears throat> I don't know. You know, this is I tell people, you know, this is a this is a tough business. I say I might listen to somebody on the radio with a, and, and 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 don't agree with it or the way that they're doing it, but I have an appreciation for what they're going through. It can be very difficult work, you know, as well as I do on a day-to-day basis. You're only as good as your last show. Yeah. You're only as good as you're there. It's not a farmer. You know, you can't say at the at the end of the day, look back and say, well, you know, I plowed 50 acres of, uh, of ground and sure looks good. You don't know whether you've done well or not. You know, who knows? The audience swings back and forth. There might be that time where the audience says, hey, I really want to listen to guys on the radio who sounded like disc jockeys back in the 1965, like I used to listen to. Who knows where it's going to go? Who were some of the guys like Neil Rogers that made you want to go into radio? Like for me, it was guys like Howard, Opie and Anthony and other guys from the Midwest. Who were some names that you were into? Well, I didn't want to go into radio. I just fell into radio. Really? I started in college and then really had no aim of what I wanted to do. And, uh, I, you know, the stars were just in alignment. I was in San Francisco bumming around, and a friend of mine back in Orlando, who I used to work with at the University of Florida, said there's an opening in Orlando in radio, and the only thing I'd ever done in college was work at the radio station. I didn't go to class. You know, I just worked at the radio station. There was an opening, <clears throat> a news opening. 
So I came all the way back to Orlando and and uh, and got the job. I think the guy who hired me liked me because I was cute at the time, <laughs> because I had a knowledge of journalism, which I had no knowledge of journalism, but learned that craft. And then when I got to be, you know, I'm kind of getting up there in years a little bit. So when I was 40, a, a guy at the station said, you can't just be a reporter for the rest of your life. That's not going to work out for you. Would you like to try the talk thing? And I, you know, I took the chance. It's just being in the, you know, so much of this is being in the right place at the right time and having a, having a lot of luck. And uh, but Neil Rogers essentially was the guy that I looked uh, I looked to when I when I first started out in the in the in the talk business. Now you've had a lot of luck, like you just said. But was there ever a point where you had to fight adversity and you might have? try to quit this business or were you always motivated to make it work jim i really wasn't motivated at all i don't know whether i am motivated uh people in this business are motivated by i think mostly ego where radio is their whole life and uh god i've known so many of them i mean and i've always when I've had the opportunity to warn them, you can't live your life that way because if you get fired, uh, what are you going to do with your life? I always have to have an avocation to keep me. I mean, I have to have a hobby or something to take my mind off what I do yeah. for work. And I've always approached this as, you know, it's a job. I have a responsibility to the people who sign my paycheck, you know, and they, they give me a nice paycheck. So I better deliver something, um, something for them. But um, I've never, you know, I've never been motivated like I have, you know, I have to get out there and be on my soapbox or this or that or whatever. My my basic function is to entertain people in some form or fashion and see where it falls. Now, what are some hobbies you do in your free time so that you Uh, don't burn out? Okay, you name it and I've done it. It's just damn, I mean, (laughs) scuba diving, uh, horseback riding. You know, just God, you know, shooting, fishing, traveling. They, you know, I mean, I usually get involved in something for a couple of years, then I drop it and move on to something else. But I have to have I have to have something outside of the studio to yeah. take my mind off of this stuff. Otherwise, you go absolutely nuts. And but I warn people. I said it again. I warn people, and I know them. I you know, I I know them. That that's all they live for. And uh, and who knows what's going to happen with with radio per se. I have my own opinions about what will happen with so-called terrestrial radio. And I warn guys in the business about what I think is going to happen and be prepared for it. So I'm just 22 years old. I'm very young, but I've been kind of a radio geek, Jim, where you're sort of opening my eyes where this is sort of what I live for because I have so much fun doing it. So what should I do? Like, what is your take on where this business is going? In 20 years? Yeah, uh, I don't know what terrestrial radio will be like. I think it's very hard to imagine where technology will take us. I think the door is wide open for that, whether it's so-called satellite streaming, podcasts, and things like that. Take all those things that are competition to terrestrial radio. They're not going to go away anytime soon. I used to think that terrestrial radio would be gone in 20 years. I, I don't quite uh, I don't quite believe that anymore, but I think the competition will be a lot stiffer from from various forms of of communication. You know, whether it's social media platforms, uh, uh, streaming, podcasting, and things like that. I think it'd be a major competition. Well, what I like about you guys and 1025 The Bone with, like, real radio is you guys just speak it as it is and you have fun radio. But to me, Jim, the biggest problem with radio is they're playing the same songs. They're doing prank calls, War of the Roses. Would you agree with me that if radio wants to survive, they need to begin coming out with better content to compete with these podcasts or satellite radio I think lo- I think local radio has to become local again. I think what's happening with a lot of local radio stations is they broadcast as if they were broadcasting nationally, and I don't think that will work anymore. Um, you have to be local 
because nobody else is doing local stuff. Even the newspapers are not printing as many local things as they do. You have to have that connection to the community. Um, that's how that I believe that's how you get the ratings. I, I really do believe that. What is your take on shows that just like voice track and the audience gets fooled to thinking that someone's in, let's say, Tampa Bay or let's say in Orlando? Do you like voice tracking or do you think it's no. like ruining the business? I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, you know, there was a time. I hate to keep going back, you know, back when I was younger, back when I was younger, but back when I was younger, you could travel to different parts. You know, if you put a blindfold on and somebody put you in a car and said, I'm not telling you what direction we're going, you could tell what part of the state you were by listening to the radio station, not because the radio station identified where they were, but you could tell by the voice of the announcer, the music that they were playing. You could be in any part. Somebody could pick you up in a machine and drop you to different parts of the United States, and you'd have a pretty good idea where you were based on what you were hearing on the radio. Now, I don't care where you are. It's, it sounds the same. And I find that, I find that rather disappointing. And I think that can, that's, that's not good for the radio business, not the terrestrial radio business. I, I can pick it up. I know when there's a guy in San Antonio who's, who's broadcasting and, and trying to have everybody believe, and I guess they do for the most part, believe that he's in, in Orlando. I know he's not in Orlando because I don't hear him talking about Orlando except for maybe one little line, hey, join the JCs Walk for Fun this weekend in downtown to raise money for blah, blah, blah. I know he's dropping that line from San Antonio or someplace else. I don't like that at all. He doesn't know anything about Orlando any more than I know anything about San Antonio. I just find it sad, Jim, that they are cool with like making the audience think that they're there, and they just or they think that we're just like idiots that are going to think that these prank calls are real or these bits or the voice tracking is there. Like, don't you think that radio needs to treat us listeners better? You know what I mean? Or the listeners? I just think it's very cheap and hacky. Well, it's hacky to me because I can hear it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if the average listener can pick up on it. No, I don't think they honest. can either. You know, radio, radio people, we have a bad habit, people, those of us in radio, believing that everybody that listens to us really gets what's going on in radio. It's like, you know, those of us in radio, you know, we get agitated when, it, when, when the ratings come out, believing that everybody out there is – you know, is is glued to their radio because they want to know what the ratings are. They don't care about the damn ratings. You know, they can hardly even remember the call letters of the stations yeah. that we that we work for. So we get we're, we're we're parochial in that way. We're we're insulated in in that way. Um, I, I don't like to. I just don't like to. I don't like the what would you call it? the McDonaldization of radio where it's all. It's just all the same. That's where talk radio, local talk radio can shine because people say, thank God something, you know, I'm in a different part of the of the state or the United States and here's something fresh or different or new, you know, whether the person is entertaining them or really pissing them off. What are some like radio shows or podcasts that you'd like to listen to? Are there any that you'll check out when you're not doing your show? Tom and Dan, of course, out of Orlando, listen to them. Yep. I've been a guest on their program a couple of times. I'm not a real podcast person because I'm not a real social media platform type of person. Not a face, you know, I got a Facebook account and all that, but I, I don't understand it that much. It's generational. It's not because I don't think it's important or it doesn't play a role in what will happen, but it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't attract me that much. So I'm not a big podcast person per se. And I know there's thousands of them out there now, and I wouldn't even know, my God, I think I'd get a headache just trying to decide what to listen to. Yeah, because here's the thing. I want my podcast to be one of the next big things, which is why I try to network and get my name out there. But the biggest thing, Jim, is there's these little podcasts. It's like I'm a little guppy fish, and guys like Kevin Smith are the sharks. Like, 
We need to work our ass off, us podcasts, to make a name for ourselves. There's so many shows that go, we are the internet radio show. It's like, no, you're an internet show. So many of these shows, Jim, try to overcompensate and be something that they're not. That is what drives me crazy. Well, the success of anything, whether it's podcasts or radio shows, marketing, you have to know how to market yourself somehow because you have to reach the audience. You know how you have to, you know, it doesn't do you any good just to have content and say, here I am, listen to me. You've got to be able to, you need to be able to step outside the studio and say, connect with people. So then they'll listen. It's, it's all marketing. I remember when Tom and Dan were starting and they've had, they've had amazing success. Um, you know, they're concerned, how are we going to market this? I mean, how are we going to make any, how are we going to make any money? And, uh, you know, they've, 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 they've figured it out. They've connected. Don't tell me how they do it, but they've connected and drawn in an audience. And that audience loves these guys. How big are Tom and Dan down there for uh, people who have not heard their show? I, from what I hear, They've got a major a major following. Can I give you a number? I have no idea yeah. what the number is. I can't I can't tell you how many people listen to, to my program. I would like to think millions, but it's not. Um, but it's enough to sustain them. Where they're they've got a new studio that they're operating out of now, yeah. and they're marketing you know all their all their all their stuff. And do you hear people hear people talking about them? Now, how do you look at your ratings? Do you get nervous or do you just keep on like doing your thing and hope for the best? For someone that's been in radio for so long, how do you approach ratings with PPM? Uh, I don't like them. <clears throat> I get nervous. Um, I mean, when the ratings come in, I mean, we've always been number one or number two, occasionally number three in the major demographics. But usually, either number one or or number two, especially with men, um, and the ratings come in. I'm nervous that day that they put the ratings, and then I start worrying about the next the next round. Um, as I've advanced in my career, and you know, I see, you know, my my retirement on the horizon. I don't give a shit too much about about them anymore. They are what they are, and. Uh, you know what are they going to do to me? Fire me? If they fire me, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm at the pretty much at the end of my career, so I don't get very nervous. If I was 30 years old, I'd be freaking out. I'd be absolutely out of my mind because they, you know, they can they can tear you apart, especially if you're on the top. If you're on the top, and then all of a sudden you're number four, number five. It's always best to be number two. Yeah. Because then you're you say, I'm gonna I'm trying to be number one, I'm gonna try to be number one. But when you're number one and you slip to number four, or you're number two and you slip to number five, because then you're looking over your shoulder and who's gonna who wants my job and uh, do I wanna go on vacation and do I want somebody filling in for me because they might do a better job than I do and blah 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 blah. And every radio person, even though they d- deny it feels that have you ever felt that way for a long time or do you like know that you're the best and you'll keep on bringing ratings do you ever feel a bit nervous about like younger competition no because no because you know i'm a year or two years away from calling it quits um so i don't feel i'm surrounded by young guys you know i got young guys all over the place but you know, as long as I can keep a position in the ratings where I, as long as I don't sock the general manager in the face or be disrespectful or insubordinate, you know, I think I can stay. But you never know. You never know when somebody comes in and says, well, we've thought about this. And, uh, you know, despite your ratings, we just don't think you're connecting anymore. So we want to move in a d- different direction. I mean, you got to wake up every day in this business and, and, and go into work knowing that they can call you into the office and say it's over with. Now, have you ever been let go from a job when you were just heartbroken, or have you been pretty lucky through your long radio career? Lucky, lucky. I've been lucky enough to be able to surround myself with good people who help support my program, who understand what I'm doing. You know, they're the, you know I don't say it much, but that's that's one of the keys to success. You have to have good people, whether they're producers whether they're on-air colleagues, 
co-hosts, whatever you want to call them. That's a big, that's a big part of the puzzle. If you have good people who can support you, it's like when I'm on the air, I have signals that I can send to usually hand signals when I've run out of something to say, or like, where I'll say to myself, I have no, to myself, I have no direction where I'm going to go next. And they, they know that's a cue for them to step in and do something to fill the time while I'm sitting back just thinking for a couple of seconds, okay, what direction do I want to take now? What do, I, do I want to revisit something? Do I want to go in a di- different direction? Oh, yeah, thanks for giving me the time where now I can remember. I can look at my notes and, and take the program you know, in this direction or that direction. That's, that's one of the keys to success. I've always believed that. Always have good people. Always have good people. Now, what is so great about your team? Because you guys just come off so natural. So what's it like working with everyone? Well, I've known them forever. I mean, uh, Mo, who's been with me, I mean, I've known her for over 30 years. She's been with the program probably 23 out of my 27. Jack, who's my producer, he's now the program director. He's on the air with me. He's been with me for over 15 years. And then uh, I've got an intern. He's not an intern anymore. He's part of the program. He's been with me for well over a year, but he took over for somebody who was with me for 10 years. You know, you work with somebody that long and they know you're, you know, you you meld. You're just just able to, you know, to work together. The the, the bad thing about that is it's like the Eagles. You know, you're together so long that they can really piss you off. Yeah. Yeah, it's like family. You, know, you love them until something comes along and you have to get mad at them or they get mad <laughs> at me. Now, have you guys ever had any bad fights, like once the mic is off or have things sure. been pretty good? No, sure. Of course. You know, where the next day I come in and close the door and, you know, I have the best of intentions of, okay, we had a little bit of problem and, and you know, sometimes – you know, my temper would get a hold of me and there'd be screaming back and forth and, you know, spit coming out of my mouth because I was so angry. And then, you know, okay, now I apologize. I'm sorry. I lost my temper, blah, blah, blah. It's usually settled out. It's like any family. Yeah. You know how that works. You know, whether you, whether it's with your spouse or a brother or sister or mother or father, you know, something something just doesn't sit right. And, and unfortunately, I would stew about it. And then let loose. And I've kind of gotten to the point, you know, with age comes a little bit more wisdom and, you know, try to get it out of the way and solve it as quickly as possible without without stewing, stewing about it and getting really angry about it. But I've had some moments where there have been some real knockdown drag outs. And if you said, well, what were they about? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like most are. Yeah, I don't remember. I have no idea what they were about. Now, let's talk about this. For young radio people like me that want to make a name for ourselves in this business, what should we do? Like, what is some of the best advice you can give me and anybody out there that's listening? Follow your gut instinct about what you're doing on the air. I mean, whether it's through your podcast or whether you're on the air. Yeah. Just just go with your, go with your instincts. You know, you can always – I mean, that's the only way you can do it. You can't – the audience always picks up a phony. I've always believed that. They've always been able to tell when somebody's, you know, lying through their teeth or yeah. making up something or not being their true self. You just have to let your true self out be, be out there, and then I there's a better than even chance the audience will connect with that because they might not agree with you, but they say, well, you know, at least he's at least he's honest, you know, at least he's telling the truth from his side. They pick up on that and they appreciate that more than somebody who's, you know, BSing. I mean, you can mess around with people a little bit and pull their leg, but it's always the guys that say, well, I'm really this in real life, but I'm going to be that on the radio that don't last long. And now before I let you go, where can people find your show online and on the radio? Well, we got the website, realradio.fm. Well, you know, then you can connect. You can then we stream through that, and then in Orlando, it's one hundred four point one on the FM dial, three to seven Monday through Friday. 
Well, Jim, thank you so much for being on my show. I've been a big fan for years. I well, love what you. you do. I love what you guys do at Real Radio 1041 because there's not much of that type of talk radio left. So my goal is to sort of like innovate and save that format because it seems like people are afraid of it now with all the fake outrage. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Well, best of luck to you. I mean, just uh, go at it with both barrels and just be honest with the audience and the audience will respond. Sounds good. Thank you, Jim, and keep up the good work. You're welcome. Thank you very much. All right, bye. Happy hour. Happy hour.